Ah ouais, non, non, c'est... Oui, 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 ça, ça marche. Ah, ok, parfait. Attends, mais là... Mais je sais pas comment... Bah, bref, ça, ça... Ok. Ok. I will, yeah. Okay, so why don't I introduce myself, yeah. So thanks for myself for inviting me and uh, yeah, it's great to, great to see everybody, everybody here. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm a senior health researcher based in Marseille and I work on, should we say, quote unquote, real simulations of materials. So looking at the deformation of materials, which I'll explain in, in a little bit. And the work over the following slides is uh, with some long-time collaborators of mine, so Cosmin Maranika and his group in CA Sackley, Danny Perez in Los Alamos, and also some work with David Wales in, uh, in Cambridge. So we've already, I think all these names have already been mentioned today, and I will try and uh, piggyback on the explanations of the previous talks. So I just want to talk about a little bit, I know we're more a mathematical community here, I just want to give some sort of setting for what we look at and the type of problems you might get when you start simulating uh, materials of scale and real materials. So you may have... Uh, especially those with a physics background, you've probably uh, all heard of, you know, you've got our sort of elemental crystal, phonons, and you can also think about taking your nice crystal and deforming it with some affine deformation. Um, in general, putting it on an, an elastic deformation. So these are kind of the simple things you can do to materials. But in reality, the even the structural and electronic properties of materials are really defined by their structure and the, the defects in that perfect crystalline structure. So we can form sort of nanoparticle type systems, we can create vacancies or interstitial atoms or clusters thereof. And also you can imagine dislocations being plastic deformations. So if I take this block and I smack it here, I create, I can form a, uh, some localized disk registry that accommodates this plastic deformation. And this is really, this is why people use metals to build bridges and things like this, is that if I, took the, if I did this to a ceramic, it would crack. If I do it to a metal, I produce plastic deformation. And that, that ability to bend and not break is really kind of the important quality of, of, of metals in particular. So we can, as we've seen today, we can simulate atoms with empirical force fields and energy models, and uh, we can simulate these type of structures. We can look at nanoparticles, we can look at uh, complicated point defects, we can look at dislocation lines, uh, either in these sort of highly idealized uh, settings, so these sort of nice uh, opera Volterra operations um, from Ernest, actually, and, uh, and look at these sort of nice lines of localized disorder. And, um, and how do we do this? We do this with molecular dynamics. So as we've already seen with forces of some potential where our positions are usually confined to some periodic volume. And as again, following on from what Tony was saying, so we can parallelize this quite So because we have some short range interactions with this potential, I can go from, I can quite easily parallelize uh, the, the evaluation of my forces. So if I have a big computer, I can uh, go to larger and larger systems because the number of atoms per processor can remain constant. And uh, this is what we call weak scaling in parallel. But the, the issue with MD, as Tony again was saying, is that because we have to integrate trajectories in serial, as in each time step comes after the previous time step, and we have to resolve terahertz vibrations, our time stepping in MD is very, very small to be able to actually just remain stable effectively. So that means that no matter what size computer you have, again, this coming from Danny's uh, picture, um, we don't have, we have very poor strong scaling. So that if I have twice as large a computer, I can simulate a system twice as large, but I can't simulate the same system twice as fast. It doesn't, doesn't really work that way. So we have a strong time scale limitation of from one to 100 nanoseconds of a, 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 a time of days. And by weight a, no matter what the size of my computer, I can generate only a few nanoseconds of trajectory. So, you know, why do we want to try and do these? The vague motivation of why we want, might want to run molecular dynamics. So if you look at, say, a nuclear materials, uh, this is one of the big issues in nuclear materials is the production of point defects that leads to swelling. And this is, this, this is numerous problems in nuclear reactors. And try to understand how these defects, in, in reality, these very complicated defect structures can move around. And they have slow, metastable, thermally activated diffusion mechanisms, and it's not isotropic. Uh, you can think about looking at dislocations in an idealized setting. So here, this is an example of a, uh, a fracture, dislocation motion mediated fracture in steels, where I have, where the motion of the dislocation line itself is a thermally activated process, as we can see sort of this soliton kink uh, mechanism here. And at different temperatures, this can really, really influence the structural properties of metals. So this is a case of where a ship was put into very cold water, 
the temperature was too low for this vacation to move, so stress built up and it cracked. You know, this, this is kind of, you can really relate these properties down to things that are happening at the atomic level, on the individual atomic level. And away from these kind of idealized settings of very clean specification lines, in, in more general settings, we actually have this much more complicated flow. So we have these, these highly transient atomic connectivity, uh, many, many junctions forming and breaking, and these quite complicated network dynamics. And these really play a role in the long time uh, aging of materials under high energy radiation or looking at fatigue and cyclic loading. So this is more similar to a sort of glassy type landscape where I have this continuous aging, very complicated dynamics, and it's not really clear a priori start to try and course change this system or to understand this. So in the first two examples, I had some pretty clear signature of mass stability, and here I don't really have a clear signature of mass stability. So what is mass stability? I think we've already seen this quite a bit. So uh, this is the idea that if I'm some 1D potential, I'm producing a histogram, and I can see that I spend much, much more time in the basins than at, at, at the saddle points. And this, I'm sure many of you kind of know these type of I these ideas. So if I have some, my potential energy function in MD has, is a high dimensional function. I, this number of positions can be a very large number and there's lots and lots of local minima. And we call the energy landscape is, as Tony was saying, is this uh, connection network of minima and saddle points. So, so, and then when these minima are very deep, I much deeper than the characteristic thermal energy, uh, the escapes are very rare. Um, by rare, I mean they can take, because we have to advance time in femtoseconds in MD, it can be from thousands to trillions of MD time steps in principle to see an event. And because I'm limited to around a billion or so time steps, maybe a few more, uh, there's lots of events that I simply won't see if I just try and run naive molecular dynamics. So there's a lot of work, which I'll touch on, trying to reduce, trying to bias this landscape to reduce the time you have to wait, or using other parallelization tricks like we saw in Tony's talk uh, to try to, again, reduce the amount of time you have to wall clock time, i.e. the amount of time I measure on my watch, to wait to observe a transition. So that's kind of biasing with what we're going to call collective variables or a type of parallel in time evolution. And I'll briefly I'll go across, I'll touch briefly on the first one and talk mainly about the second in the first bit of this talk. So how do I accelerate some MD? I think we've seen, we'll see some lot more of this next week. But the general idea is that you want to try to, uh, this, the space of positions, sort of, you know, some sort of three N dimensional space is, is far too large to really build a function on. Ideally, you first want to try to really reduce the dimensionality of, of your system by finding some low dimensional manifold of one to maybe four dimensions, such that I can run biased dynamics with respect to this modified potential, potentially adaptive, so it varies in time, and such that the, the, uh, the rare events that I see are accelerated. So with some famous examples of something like metadynamics or adaptive biasing force, and um, I'll also talk about the whole suite of it, techniques from Botha and Bothanimov, which are I it's sort of my school, if you like. So the real issue is trying to build this function. In general, it's extremely hard. Um, there's lots of machine learning ideas now. So we have with Cosmin, Cosmin's group looked at some, some applications of this. Um, you can try to think about, uh, let's go straight to the sort of state of the art, if you like. There's a lot of work now trying to use autoencoder type networks where we try to find some low dimensional embedding of the dynamics such that the reconstruction is accurate. Um, this, again, the sort of, ideally you would like to, use this space to work out the committer function, so the probability that I would go to my target state before returning to my initial state. But these are, these are things that you can write down, but in practice are extremely hard to achieve. And especially for materials problems where I have highly delocalized mechanisms, um, often in competition with thermal vibrations, it's really hard to divine, to de design collective variables uh, for general simulations. And in general, you can't. You can, you can design some specialized geometries or specialized setups with a restricted range of mechanisms where I can study them, I can kind of get a handle on the mechanisms and I can build collective variables. But, and we've done, so that was work with Cosmin and I looking at specifications. It's also been work looking at nucleation and uh, grain bound, uh, migration of boundaries. So there's, in some cases you can do it, but you have to do some pretty hard work to get something that actually works. So we have a scheme where we can relate the minimum energy path to the to a nearby minimum free energy pathway, and uh, with no need, we, we use this minimum energy path as our collective variable. So that's a that's a scheme that we developed a few years ago that's been kind of used in a bunch of settings now. But in general, it's very hard. You just do this do this dimensionality reduction. Therefore, 
everything after it is also hard because the first step is hard. So, so if we so if we can't reduce dimensionality, what else what else could we do? So, the um, ah, is there a slide before that or no? Oh no, there's not. Okay. <laughs> so even so, also just kind of come back to this first point. There's many many systems where I don't really have a clear signature of metastability either. So I'm going to come back to these in the second half of my talk, where we don't really have this clear metastability. So, so this is kind of the main idea. I'll talk about a case where without, what can we do when we have thermally activated dynamics, and how can we build models in that sense? Very much in the spirit of Tony's talk, trying to mapping MD to a Markov jump model. And what can I do when I don't have this nice thermal activation, and I have to look at much more complicated systems? What, what can I do to try and predict the dynamics of, of, the, of the materials in this setting? So going back to this slide we saw before. So when I have these nice deep uh, metastable energy minima, um, I have these rare events, and this, is, this is, means dynamics are very slow, but it also means that they're in some sense theoretically quite simple. So when I have this spectral gap, so when I have this uh, very deep minima, I have the phonon time scales and all the other time scales are well separated. And then I know, as, as we saw in detail in Tony's talk, that uh, the dynamics become decorated inside the basins, and they have this simple exponential escape law. There's more general way to define these basins, but I'm just going to talk about in terms of energy minima. So this is nice because I know that I have this decorrelation inside my basins, and um, using this, this scheme of the QSD and all the stuff that we heard, heard this morning, I have this, I have this pretty rigorous map between molecular dynamics to some form of Markov jump model. I'm going to go one step further and actually directly estimate the rates using a rate law for, the, for that Markov jump model. But the general idea is that when we have this metastable minima, I can really use this. Um, I know that I have a total escape rate from my basin, some hypothetical escape rate. And I know that for a given estimate of my escape rate, this would be the estimated law of escape. So how, how can this help us in practice to overcome metastability? Because we can know we can make trajectories independent, we can create many trajectories in parallel, and uh, you can actually then collate uh, the waiting time. So I can, I can effectively produce lots of independent Markovian segments, and I can add them together. And once I have one of them escaping, I can, I can uh, have some parallel speed up. So the number of copies I have, I can then ex in, general, in general accelerate the waiting time I have until I see an escape event. And so this is, this is already nice. There's very few assumptions here apart from just metastability. I can parallelize in parallel computation, and I effectively am now achieved parallel in time acceleration. Um, this is already nice. Uh, we would go one step further than this when we have access to a, a rate law for these transitions, so like the iron kramers law. Um, we can actually then exploit the fact access to this rate law because we know we have simple exponential kinetics. A, an exponential sample of one rate has just a simple rescaling relation to an exponential, exponential sample of a different rate. So therefore, I can, in this setting, I can run uh, MD at a high temperature and infer, oh, there we are, good. I can run MD at a high temperature and infer some of the dynamics at low temperature. So this gives us a really nice speed up as well. So in the end, what we do in our in our accelerated MD is that we do a lots of sampling in parallel and at high temperature, and we produce a set of transition rates, a set of first passage times, and a set of total residence times in all the states that we've seen. But, so this is, this is nice, but this is kind of related to some of the questions we had earlier on. I have a scheme in principle to map my MD to some network, Markov jump model, the network of states. But it's not at all clear that I have a complete network and in general, in the sort of language of uh, Rumsfeld, I have these sort of known unknowns. So I know that I haven't found all the states in my system, and I, and I know that uh, uh, I know they exist, but I don't know what they are. So what we'd like to do is try to produce some way of bounding uh, these unknown rates, the missing escape rate from each state. And this will actually help us to try and manage how we might build these networks uh, at scale in actual computation. So. What we do is that we're going to map our system rather than just to a Markov jump model. It's going to be an absorbing Markov jump model where we have one state that represents our ignorance, things we haven't seen in, in, in the system. And what our goal is to try to estimate the rate to this unknown state. And this corresponds to everything that we haven't seen in the system. Which seems like, how might one do this? Well, this works. We can actually, we can actually do this because we, have a, uh, we know that the escape rates follow this first, first order exponential law. So this actually allows us to derive using this law. We can derive a Bayesian likelihood for having for that for the expectation that we see something new in our next batch of MD. So it's quite a very simple 
uh, past pattern statistics. So I say for a postulated total rate, I take away the total rate that I've seen, I have some remainder, and so the probability that I see something new for a given total, for a given unknown rate is simply this very simple expression here. And then I can then apply that as a, I can then look at this and get a use Bayes' law to have a posterior given all of my waiting times and all of the events that I've seen in the MD, I can multiply these, these likelihoods together and I can use a Bayesian posterior for the likelihood that the total rate is this amount for a given the data that I've already observed. And it turns out you can actually perform these integrals analytically and you can evaluate them extremely, you know, you can evaluate them with a, with a recursive algorithm, you know, there's no kind of quadrature or anything like that. So that you can even auto diff the whole thing. So this is, this is actually a quite nice uh, uh, compact form that gives you a posterior distribution which decays exponentially at, at the long rates and, and has a strict cutoff uh, bounded by the total rate that I've already seen. So we can, so this is in the end, we can, we actually have an estimate for these absorbing rates and we also use higher moments of this distribution for resource allocation. But the general idea is that I have for every single state, I have all the observed exit rates for the other seen states and I have this estimate of the unknown rate for everything that I haven't seen. So just to sort of not going too much into the details, but this allows us to really manage things at scale because I can put these into an absorbing Markov chain with a set of unknown rates. I can ask for the average time to reach that absorbing state for a given initial condition. And this gives me a very clear prediction time scale of my model. And I can then do a sensitivity analysis to work out where I should, which state should I do more sampling in to maximally increase this prediction time scale. So this allows us, this is a very autonomous scheme to allocate resources at scale. So this, we've run this on up to 100,000 cores with a sort of hierarchical management system. And effectively at each cycle, I, I'm collating data, building this absorbing Markov chain, um, performing this sens sensitivity analysis, working out where I should optimally do more work to, to improve the quality of my model and cycle and repeat. So this scales very well and it provides a scheme that I can very, this, because I don't need to have any human um, uh, sort of, uh, there's no hand tweaking here effectively. It means I can really deploy it on these very, very large systems, very large parallel systems where I have to make a decision every 10 seconds over where I should do work. So this provides a completely automated scheme. And I just, um, in this particular example, this was tried to maximize this for as long as I would run the program for, but we can also think about other observable Markov chains using the same same procedure. So when you do this, oh, okay, this that was for an exascale conference, so I wanted to show that I can exascale. But, um, so when you do that, you can you can really start to throw some computational resources at this problem. So we go away from these quite simple model systems, and we can look at sort of complicated, so this is looking at diffusion in uh, complicated alloys, or with uh, Cosmin's group in Sackley, which was published just in Nature Comms uh, a month ago or so. We really started to look at these um, complicated structures uh, that, you, that, that you find in some irradiated materials that have a large influence on their aging under irradiation. And we sort of, you know, two thousand quite modest resources, about 2,000 cores for six hours, and we found this very large network of states with a, um, and lots of different transitions between them. And we can really start to explore. Uh, these aren't just random states. They have a kinetic relevance because they're produced in dynamics. So we can really start to have a, uh, an idea of the kinetic stability of certain structures and start to explore very large systems. Um, and we, we applied this to, this is currently being applied to a, a wide variety of systems. So we can use this in this sort of open-ended sense. I want to really have a kinetically valid idea of the, of the landscape surrounding some defect of interest. I can also look at much simpler systems where I have some uh, periodic symmetry. So you can think of something like a simple sort of surface trimer and I can use the periodic symmetry to really restrict the number of states that I have. And we can plug that again into our Markov chain. And then we can actually produce diffusion constants um, as a sort of walker with death process. So I can, before I get absorbed to the unknown rate, I, I displace, so I produce a, a, a diffusion constant. And you can actually then propagate through that work with death problem to a random walk. And again, have a sensitivity of the diffusion constant with respect to these unknown rates, this sort of uncertainty quantification. You can then propagate that through, in a Monte Carlo sense, to get bounds on my diffusion. And then I can look at the uh, callback lever for over the spread of solutions to the diffusion equation, and then get a metric for a convergence metric for my uh, diffusion constants as well. So I can really sort of, so I don't just get the raw model, I can sort of upscale this on the fly and then produce, have a converged estimate for transport coefficients uh, with, with these uncertainties on sampling. So this is work published a few years ago with Danny. And uh, we have some quite nice properties where we can really as you see here, this is a very simple two-model system where I have some estimate of the diffusion constant. 
when I discover a new pathway, that estimate goes up, but the kubak lieber spread across all possible solutions consistent with my sampling is, is, is monotonically decreasing. So this is quite a nice property that you don't normally get with uh, these models. How long, how long time do I have? Oh yeah, about half an hour, okay. So, so this is what we can do. So what we, the real key that we had here was that we had this weight law for the process. Uh, we knew we had this first order Poisson uh, law, and then we can use that to, to put an uncertainty on the remaining uh, uh, kinetics or the, the unobserved transitions that we haven't seen. And then we can propagate this through using all the tools of Markov chain. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean that's, that's the sort of diffusion constants you can get. They can be highly anisotropic and all the rest of it. With, um, I think I won't ask close, with David Wales, we've started looking at also analyzing these very large networks, which when you get to low temperatures and you have metastability, um, the rate network itself actually produces numerical issues. Like it goes beyond the floating point precision you get on computers. So you actually can't use linear algebra routines. You can't get eigenvalues or any of these sort of things. So we've, we've done quite, we've done a bit of work with, uh, with, with David Wales' group to kind of see about how we can apply all of these spectral analysis type Markov chain reduction techniques to, to systems where you have a very large uh, Markov chain, which you cannot apply uh, floating point operations to. So you, so you can't actually produce like eigenvalues or mean first passage times on, on the bare matrix itself. And there's, there's a, there's a, we've done a, uh, with some various students, and we've done a bit of work on this in the course framing these, these problems for numerically ill-conditioned Markov chains. But I'm not, again, not really going to go into that, that so much. So this is, this is kind of what we can do if we have a Markov jump model. We have this nice metastability kinetics, and we can match the Markov jump model, and there's lots of things we can do. But as I kind of said, there's lots of cases where this nice metastability, this nice spectral gap doesn't really exist. And there we have to, we have a, we have a much sort of weaker theoretical handhold on how we characterize the dynamics. So this is a, has lots of applications. So even just to just have large systems, there's always something happening. There's no real metastability here. Uh, if I look at these dislocation systems that I talked about before, there's a, there's a constant sort of viscous aging, non-stationary kinetics, the microstructure is always changing. And it's not really clear how I might try and map this to a metastable type problem. I mean, more, more generally, I want, to, I want to have some properties of the system that I want to try to track. Uh, I can't be looking at directly at the position space is, is really not, not feasible, um, not least because it has all these unphysical degeneracies. So, you know, I can, I can, I can permute identical atoms, I can perform rigid transformations, and this vector changes even though the system itself is identical. This is obviously clearly a very bad space for analysis. If I want to try to compare any two systems, even getting the neighbor alignment with the, with the, just, just the, the uh, position of identities of atoms, it becomes very complicated. So we have kind of two goals. We want to try to get, put this into a much nicer space for analysis, but not so compact that sufficiently, you know, sufficiently detailed that I can extract any observable I want after the fact in the sort of a, a posteriori setting. But I also want to try to remove these unphysical degeneracies so I can kind of have some compression of data. And also I'd like to be able to try to look at this compressed representation and predict how it evolves with time. So we've seen that designing collective variables in general, trying to produce a system to one or two dimensions is very complicated or in general very challenging and is, is hard to do. So what our approach was to try to go to a medium rank representation so around sort of 50 to 100 dimensions. And to do this, we want to try to represent atomic environments in some form of space invariant determination of rigid, rigid uh, operations with a rank of around 200. So this is actually ideal for what we call these descriptor functions that are really coming out in, this is effectively representation learning for atoms. And um, uh, so there's a, a large sort of catalog of various what we call descriptor functions around. And what these are to try to give an idea for example, just the, um, the radial distances between all the atoms would be a very good descriptor. And you can see immediately that if I took, for example, the average radial distance between all the atoms, this is a scalar that's invariant to identical permutation. So it kind of satisfies what I might want. More and more generally, I can think about summing over my neighbors, so which again is invariant to the permutation of, 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 of identical atoms. And any function of, sort of two body, three body angles, or I can think about many body generalizations of this, I can produce a, uh, a representation of the atomic environments of my system. Now, we're going to use, typically use up to four body functions, and we're going to use a particular flavor of these functions, which um, are actually representing a, many, uh, a higher order Fourier expansion of these many body environments. So you can think of them as a kind of a higher, uh, what often called angular Fourier series of three body, or these bispectrum uh, Fourier series for, for four body functions. So this is, this is it's, 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 it's to a 
to a Fourier transform, if you like, a, a spectral representation of these many body environments. And what it does is that it maps your entire system to a vector, I sum over all the atoms in this original, in this, all the slides that I show here, I'll be summing over all the atoms in the system. I produce a global vector of around 50 to 200 uh, numbers, which uh, represents my entire system. And at each time frame, I then have this the 200 dimensional time series that represents my, my simulation. Um, and this is already very nice for analysis because I've taken this horrible high dimensional uh, with lots of unphysical degeneracies, uh, this space here, to a space which is much more compact and is a metric space when I have these spectral, I have a triangle inequality, and I have all of these degeneracies removed. So I can very quickly uh, compare two vectors to compare any two simulations. And what I then do is then I take this vector and I can train using, say, a linear model or a neural network, whatever you want to do, uh, train this, this representation to, to predict observables of my system. So I can think about microstructural properties or energies or entropies. Um, with, Co with Cosmin, we looked at, uh, now Nika, we looked at uh, entropy extraction using this sort of idea. And I've generalized this to look at pretty much any property of system that is a function of the local atomic structure, you can, you can extract with this, with this method. Um, we can look at sort of scalar properties or, uh, and we can, I can even look at um, uh, correlation functions by taking a series expansion and learning the scalar coefficients of a series expansion of correlation functions. So, so I, can, I can produce radial correlation functions with this method or predict all these different uh, number of dislocation junctions in the system. So really quite things that you would imagine be quite obscure properties. We can really, this is a 200 dimensional metric space that is sensitive to all of these, all these properties of a wide range of simulations. So we have a, it's a, it's a massive dimensionality which but it's still high enough that I'm sensitive to all of these different properties in the, in the system. And I can then also, I can produce metric, uh, maybe just, yeah, we can produce matrix value properties or as well as scalar value properties. We can do quite a lot of things with this. So this is kind of already a slightly more general idea than a collective variable. It is a medium dimensional metric representation that's sensitive to the properties I might want to take in my system. And the idea is then is that if I can use work in this sort of 200 dimensional metric space, can I predict the, the future of some time series based on data that I've learned? And if I can predict the future trajectory in this descriptor space, I can then later um, project out the observables using my pre-trained uh, models. So I only, only need to store a tiny fraction of the positions at some random set of positions that's my simulation. I can use that to train an observable uh, predictor, and then I can then just work directly in this compressed space. So this is, this is nice. There's lots of practical reasons why this is nice because I can, I, uh, you know, some of these simulations can produce terabytes and terabytes of data and it's actually not really possible to store it. So here we can actually really have much more detailed analysis. This is an example of the black line is the model. Uh, there's some, some complicated, some dislocation properties, total amount of length in the system. And uh, I only have to, I can observe it infrequently and interpolate all the other data points with this representation. Um, and again, this is sufficiently rich that I can actually extract out the force grain properties after the fact. I don't need to, unlike with lots of collective variables, I don't have to pre-specify the properties that I'm interested in. This is a very generic four-body function of the local atomic environment. So uh, there's lots of different analysis things you can do with this. So I looked at this, uh, uh, I think I will, this is a, oh, there we are. Where are we? Oh, did I skip a slide? Maybe. Oh, okay, so, so for example, you can take, um, you can try to look at the, is, you know, in this uh, descriptor space, this two-dimensional space, is there a, is the data on, on a manifold in this space? So it's not a linear manifold, you can check that quite easily. And you can use some of these, there's various schemes for estimating intrinsic dimension of manifolds. And um, we actually also have a prediction from crystal plasticity that we expect the intrinsic dimension to be, have a lower bound of two uh, from a, a sort of a shearing law from crystal plasticity. Um, and you can show that if the, uh, if the stress state is, is, is deterministic from the descriptors, then the intrinsic dimension of the descriptors uh, is, is an upper bound to the intrinsic dimension of my stress. And so all of these estimators, what we really see is that they typically, they're known to kind of underestimate the true data to try and have widely varying variances. What you really see is that I, when I start to yield my system, which means when I start to yielding is, so I'd mention to put this for people who don't do material science, you typically have strain and you have stress. 
and a linear system just increases linearly like this. And then yielding is when uh, I, I break away from this linear behavior. So this is a ductile material, and a brittle material like a ceramic just falls off a cliff and cracks. So this yield point here is really the transition from plastic deformation, from elastic deformation to plastic yielding. And this is really the key. Understanding this transition is uh, really important in many settings. And it's actually because of the complex nature of these type of systems, it's, there's, there's a lot of open questions regarding this actual type of yielding transition in many different materials. So it's, it's quite an open question in, in uh, like the order of this transition and, and what's the correlation length of transitions. There's not a lot known on it. And what's quite interesting is that you see here, pre at yielding, the intrinsic dimension of my manifold collapses, and I have this much lower dimensional embedding of my space. So already, I have this quite abstract representation of the microstructure. I can also clearly see it's in a localization in the PCA on this same trajectory. So this is showing that this, we've already seen that it's sensitive enough to all the coarse grain properties I might want to have, but it also is able to capture more geometric ideas of these very complicated systems that I otherwise wouldn't really be able to have a handhold on because there's just so much going on here. So there's, I think I did have another example, but Okay, I think I skipped a slide for some reason. But that. Um, so now to, to, to end this, I'm saying, okay, so I can analyze the trajectories, but ideally I want to try to generate the trajectories. I want to try to generate them in time and predict the future of these trajectories as well. So to do this um, using a pretty classical time series idea, so this is just a, a vector autoregressive model. Uh, it's very simple. I say that the next time step is some weighted average of my previous time steps plus some uh, noise. And you can, you know, there are more complicated options are available, but the nice thing with, so yes, yeah, so this, this is, you can think of this as like a dynamic mode function or a Kutman operator uh, with this sort of relationship, and you can check a chapman komorgov test in this sort of stacked history. So if I stack up all these histories, this object here uh, is Markovian, and therefore it should pass a chapman komorgov test, which you, which you can do, and it, and it passes it. So um, this is really, this is ideal for systems that aren't meta stable in this case. So because we have this constant aging, this is more what, what we're really trying to predict here with this model. The, and the idea is that we want to try to do this. We can want to try to resample pre-existing trajectories to interpolate initial conditions. And we want to try to predict the future, both for sort of long time scales, but also to work out which simulations have the most promise of additional discovery. So this is kind of a, a sort of a parallel tempering type, type idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not so much learning. No, it's, 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 it's a predefined um, expansion of many. So you, it's defined a priori, but it's a very general expansion. So it's kind of a spectral expansion of, of all the four body environments in your system. And we've definitely, we can, we've voxelized, you can voxelize this thing, or we can sum it over the entire system. So I'm just looking at the sum over the entire system. So it's like a spectral expansion of all the four body atomic environments. So it's, you know, uh, there's obviously lots of other, so because that with the radial distance of these functions, you have the correlation function. But you can also think about taking a, an autocorrelation of that signal itself. So the, this, you can think of this as a, as a high dimensional signal coming from this box, and I can spatially resolve this and I can look at spatial correlations, but I'm just looking at the most basic average over the system in this time. So, so what's nice about these, this autoregressive model, it looks linear, but it actually turns out in sort of 200 dimensions, you can do quite a lot with linear models. Um, you, you know that you have a simple max likelihood solution. And what's really nice is that you can estimate ep epistemic errors. So there's, there's ways of doing this, uh, sort of MCMT type ways, but they're, they, they don't scale that well with dimension. But um, you can use, you know, sort of cutting edge 1996 machine learning techniques. So you can uh, use a, a subsampling algorithm to estimate the epistemic errors in this, in this solution. So I can take a bagging subsample of my, of my fits and in about typically so 10 to 30 seconds on a normal CPU, I can do everything. So I can train the model, I can produce all the epistemic errors, and I can produce new trajectories. So this is an, a nice property other, because if you look at these sort of, you know, uh, neural network ideas or neural ODEs and all these sort of things, they have a, they're, they're really interesting techniques, but they're quite limited in dimension and they're very expensive to train. They're also very expensive to put any UQ on. And that's really, you know, this is all fine, but I really want to be able to have an idea of uncertainty on any predictions that I make to this model for it to have any real practical use of any sort. So how do I do that? Well, I really want to try to have an extrapolation grade. So luckily, for these type of representations, which are used a lot to build energy models, 
um, you can actually show for these type of systems that if the distribution of all the descriptors are fairly universal, uh, unimodal. And this allows us to use a pretty simple extrapolation grade called the Mahanoda distance. You can kind of see it's basically a measure of standard deviation. And this is used a lot in, in active learning schemes. So if I'm trying to find new atomic environments I haven't seen before, I want to try and learn the energies and forces, I have, a, I have a qualification on uncertainty using this extrapolation grade. There's other methods using um, uh, manifold density estimates or um, some sort of max, some convex hull type ideas. They all roughly do the same thing, that if I'm far, if I have some test point that's far from my training data, I'm, I'm in a qualitative sense uncertain. So what, what does that mean? It means that in my model, if I make a, if my model predicts a trajectory which moves far from the training data, even if these epistemic errors are low, my, uh, my extrapolation grade is high and I shouldn't trust my, my forecast, my forecasted uh, trajectory. So we also, of course we have a finite amount of training data, we can also uh, bound, uh, have an additional growth in uncertainty due to the finite training time, which again, you can have a theoretical bounds on how this should grow with your simulation. So, and I'll show those some plots for that uh, in the next few slides. So what does this look like? So here, what do I have? So here I have uh, some nanoparticles from melt. So they start off very disordered and they eventually get more and more crystalline as time goes on. And you can just see here, this red line here is the entire time I spent training the system. And then everything else is, is extrapolation. And the black line is the MD ground truth. The orange lines, you can't really make it out on this slide, but the orange line is the prediction of my model. And here we have this qualitative measure of uncertainty. I have the amount of different crystal structures. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And then, and this is the decay in energy. So you can see it's clearly a non-stationary simulation. There's some aging with time. And when I have a very smart training data, I recapture the first bit of training stage quite well. But after a couple of, uh, about a few hundred picoseconds, I go, no, I'm, I'm really wrong because I haven't learned enough about my system. So you can see the prediction is going way off. But crucially, the, the forecasted outlier distance also goes really high. So I know that my model is wrong in a completely unsupervised sense because the extrapolation grade is high thanks to this, this measure of, of a metric, uh, extrapolation metric. So then I can increase the training a little bit. I see already that I'm getting better. My extrapolation grade goes much lower. In fact, my theoretical bounds on the minimum from the lower bounds for this growth very closely matches the MD actually. But so then I'm already getting a much tighter uh, look and then I go to a bit more training data and I'm getting pretty much bang on the MD and my extrapolation grade remains low. And I can, so again, I'm predicting the sort of, here it's a 50 dimensional vector that I'm predicting, and then I'm extracting out the energy or the SVT content or the amorphous content or all these other properties of the system by looking forward in time. So I'm picking this aging type of problem and, I can, and I'm propagating a fairly high dimensional representation of the system. And then I can also measure the outlier distance from this. So this is a fairly simple little nanoparticle system. You know, it's not going to, to it's not that much going on here. It's still, still fairly simple. We can look at much more complicated systems. So this is looking at a, a cyclic loading of copper. And again, I can sort of do one cycle. And here I can see that my, my max likelihood solution is fairly stable, but the epidemic errors are large. And I have this growing outlier distance. But then if I sort of do a bit more training, I can really stabilize things and I get this sort of cyclic steady flow. And I can really, uh, again, get out these very complicated properties of these, of these, these boxes. And going back to finally, because this yielding example is probably the more complicated system what I want to make a point here is that you see the growth. I'm starting my simulations from the same initial condition as the MD. So I'm resampling the yielding transition and I have these sort of stress drops. You sort of know it's not just an exponential decay at my point. You, know, you have these sort of non-monotonic ev evolutions and you, and you have growth of environments. You have decay of other microstructural properties and you can look at things like the flow stress and things like that. And they, they match uh, very well with the MD. Even you have these uh, sort of growth and then, then, then shallow, then plateauing. And again, I have this sort of outlier distance in my metrics. I can really try and look at how confident I am. And the nice thing then is that because I have, I can take my initial conditions at some initial time, I can fit this to say some high dimensional Gaussian, I can resample producing 100 times more initial conditions, and then turn my, this is this sort of sparse histogram of MD snapshots. I can then in about, you know, I don't know, a, a few minutes from start to end from training and generation, I can then turn these sparse MD histograms into, into much smoother distributions. Again, this is a distribution in the here about 120 dimensional space, which I can then project onto various observables and propagate through time. So I, I can really do this, like the, the, not just forecasting the future, but I can also kind of have some recycling and conversion tests on these same systems. So this is something that, you know, you see the, this is quite nice in the sense that I can, 
now the current work is really sort of maximizing this to say that can I just take some a few snapshots of various initial conditions and then I can interpolate them with this this model. And and I know I can be confident of these predictions because my outlier distance is remaining low throughout the entire process before I start forecasting forwards in time. So I think that okay, I didn't say anything there, but yeah, <laughs> there we go. I think I'll end with that. Um one one last thing. Uh so I work in Marseille, this is the city of Marseille. This is our labs. People you know see them know this very well already. But uh, I have, a, just to promote this to any, one might be thinking about doing a postdoc at some point. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is the Calon Conceum. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, where are we? Like that. There. That could be you. So we have uh, some grants coming out next year on looking at some of these problems. Uh, so if you'd like, if this, you know, anyone think might be interested in those sort of problems, you can uh, get in touch with me. So, yeah, thank you.